Welcome. Thank you. Um, your ears were burning there. I know you weren't in the room. Um, you did come up in conversation in the last panel. Um, a lot has been said and written, and uh, there's been buzz around sidewalk, um, and it's focused on some issues, and the point that they made, I think it's a good one, and I think we'll come back to it, is it's highlighted some really important public policy issues that we have yet to grapple with right. in this country. Um, where I want to start is actually where you're going. Uh, you have a master development and innovation plan, I think it's called. Yep. Uh, we have yet to see it. It's coming. Coming, coming in the next several weeks. Not, it, it'll be in the spring. Okay. And if spring ever arrives. And what will it tell us? What is in that plan? Well, I actually think it's going to be a pretty remarkable document. I say that with non-Canadian lack of humility. But uh, it's really going to lay out first and foremost, sort of the plan. So the physical plan for a place that actually integrates a whole set of innovations across sort of every aspect of urban life um, into the physical place in a way that I don't think has ever actually been done before. It's gonna, the second volume of it, if you will, is gonna go into a lot of detail on what those innovations are and how they actually can be achieved and what the impacts are. And the third is about the partnership between the public sector and a private entity. And you know, in many levels, um, what we are doing is breaking new ground, and whether that is on sort of the innovation agenda, um, on sort of the way it integrates with that physical place, you know, regulatory issues, policy issues, financial issues, and it's gonna lay it all out in I think detail that is going to be uh, hopefully gratifying to people who've been asking for a lot of detail. Much of what will be in there we've talked about somewhat publicly already, virtually all of it, uh, but it'll just be much more detailed. I mean, the, the key thing is, you know, we, it's important to recognize, you know, we responded to an RFP by a public entity, Waterfront Toronto, um, and we're fortunate to be selected. Waterfront Toronto had essentially four objectives that it wanted to achieve by thinking about what can you do with innovation or technology sort of that's available to us today, um, combined with great urban design. And they were basically set a new standard for affordability, particularly with respect to housing, achieve climate positivity, um, demonstrate new ways of moving people around. Uh, particularly given the issues that exist here with that, and have sort of inclusive, really a new model for inclusive economic opportunity. And I think we're going to be able to meet every single one of those standards in a way that no one's ever done before. So interesting, I mean, w whenever we undertake a major infrastructure project, the first and biggest impediment is the, the legacy that you deal with, right? You're always dealing with an existing, you know, you ran right. a city. Um, this is a, a clean slate. Now, you have some history with this, right? Because you were behind Hudson Yards. I've seen comparison made to, made to the two. Other than potentially sort of the revenue generating potential and maybe bond issuance, are there comparisons? Because Hudson Yards is a pretty classic, it's beautiful, but well, classic I, development. Yeah, no, I think in terms of the actual physical development, the answer is no. I think in terms of um, taking an area of a city that has been essentially either neglected or failed to develop for over 100 years for very good reasons, and trying to find new approaches that can actually break that log jam. And from that perspective, the answer is yes. Every place is different, and every place uh, and every time is different. I mean, if you look at the, the land on the waterfront over there, People sometimes forget that no one lives there. Um, no one has lived there for the hundred, essentially, for the 107 years since it was filled in. There have been a whole set of attempts to actually make it a productive part of Toronto's economy. First, it was going to be uh, industrial, um, and it kind of missed the market because the Depression then set in, and then World War II, then the uh, manufacturing economy declined like it did in all Northeastern North Americans. Then, you know, it was going to be a site for the Olympics, and that was going to be the catalyst. That didn't happen. But out of it 
Waterfront Toronto actually was born at the end of the day. And I have to give Waterfront Toronto incredible credit because they recognized that the normal patterns of development on the waterfront were producing results that satisfied very few people. You know, we're producing basically glassy condos that a very small percentage of Torontonians could actually afford. And they recognize that we're in an era today when there's a set of technologies uh, that are available to us that potentially can change the paradigm. And they looked for an innovation and funding partner and said, we're really thrilled, to, despite you know, the criticism and stuff, which I'm sure we'll talk about, to have the opportunity to kind of show what might be possible today. Well, let's talk about it. Um, there's, it feels like fear really, of, um, of the unknown of, and the analogy that was given before, which I think is a, a useful one, is where data is the, f the fuel, in this case, jet fuel. Google is the airline. They know how to use it. They can use it right away. And we're kind of the, the you know, doofuses on the sideline just giving them the fuel. It's fear. Do you, do you empathize with that? Do you get it? What, you know, look, I, I do think that um, what, we, what is possible here is different than what people have historically known. Um, and most people, myself included, you know, are just scared of change. And so their first reaction is often to um, say no. I mean, my, my staff jokes sometimes that I have a four-part reaction to every new idea. The first is instant rejection. And then the second is reconsideration almost as instantly. The third is acceptance. And the fourth is, you know, within a relatively short period of time, it was my idea. <laughs> and, and so I think it's very natural for people to fear um, change. And I think it's actually quite healthy, to be perfectly honest. I do think the specific concerns, I think when people actually see the plan in its totality about this is really all about the data, are going to prove to be unfounded. This is about finding a new way to build buildings that actually could be 20% cheaper that will enable us in part to achieve 40% affordable housing on the waterfront. This is about thinking about how in an era in which self-driving cars are coming, we can actually prepare for that future and demonstrate what's actually possible and find ways to make our roads dramatically more dynamic and usable. It's about um, it's about getting people out onto the streets, which will now be safer because of the types of vehicles on the road and the way we design the streets through weather mitigation. And yeah, we'll use some weather data so that the aprons, building raincoats that we're creating can unfurl automatically. But this notion that somehow this is this kind of data-driven kind of surveillance place is not at all true. And in fact, you know, what we've said is um, that, you know, when you think about the data that people are worried about, what we call urban data, data that is generated about people in public spaces or semi-public spaces, said we shouldn't be the ones to own it. Um, we think that should be done democratically. There should be an independent data trust overseen by government um, where people have to make applications to use data, us being treated we've been treated no differently than anybody else. And so I think when people really see the plan, what they see is it's really an urban plan that, yes, in some cases, use data to make urban life better, maximize sort of how we use efficiency or how we use our roads, how we get more out of the resources that we actually have rather than about driving people's lives. And I said, obviously, people will have to see it for, to believe us, but uh, I think people will be quite surprised by that. And we'll see, obviously, as you say, stages of uh, kind of an unveiling of plans. At the moment, you're talking about a t 10, 12 acres of, uh, of land. Is there an idea that this could be much bigger? There is more land there. Not, not much that we would actually be the developer of. You know, we, we have this set of ideas um, I mentioned like wood buildings, for example, um, that we believe can have dramatic impacts on quality of life. We sort of see the first 12 acre site um, as one where those ideas will get rolled out at first and we'll have to prove that they mm -hmm. achieve what we think they do. But with the exception of one other site, 
um, we don't really have any, we don't have any plans to do the development of the rest of the waterfront. Um, instead, what we'd like to be is, a, is helpful and a catalyst to others, particularly people here locally, um, taking some of those ideas and scaling them because we do believe that scale matters. If you want to be climate positive, it's hard to achieve it on 12 acres. There is a path to getting there on a broader, but doesn't mean that we have to be the ones to do it. We can simply help government in a way in the private sector make that possible. So uh, people will, I think, be begin to realize that the role we want to play is really catalyst, which is completely consistent with Waterfront Toronto's RFP, where what they said was is that we want an innovation and funding partner, mm -hmm. um, and that really is the role that we are hoping to play here. One of the, um, I think, the points where people get uh, concerned or even skeptical is Google Alphabet, um, because they are in the business of data and they're in the business of monetizing data and they don't pretend any other thing. And so then you go to why, what's in it for Google here? Why does Google want to do this? And that's a bit of a, you're not a Google man. No. <laughs> you, uh, you came to this because of the project, I assume. Um, but yeah, that was it. I mean, I'd say really, Larry Page and I have shared a view, and the view is, we're at one of these very unusual moments in history that if you really look back at like the last 200 years of urban history, um, there have been three prior urban technology revolutions that have materially improved standards of living in cities. The first was the, um, not all of them have been you know, completely positive either, but the first was the steam engine in the early part of the 1800s. The second was the electric grid in the later part of the 1800s. And the third was the automobile in the early part of the 1900s. And we think that we're at sort of a fourth moment where we can see dramatic increases in quality of life with carefully, thoughtfully, privacy-sensitive approaches. And so this really doesn't come from sort of a Google um, a, a, a Google perspective at all. It really is sort of an alphabet, which is the holding company, which is doing a lot of really interesting things. Um, you know, whether that is self-driving cars or uh, there's a company called Calico in there that's working on um, aging issues, actually, in, increasing lifespans. Um, there's a number of others where they actually think that it's a just important thing to do. And I'm not saying that we don't have a profit motive, but if you were to talk to every single person, most importantly me, um, at Sidewalk about why we're doing this, it's because we think there's an opportunity to demonstrate, first here in Toronto and then to the world, that there actually is a new model um, to um, help cities address what I think is sort of a the fundamental question is, can we actually make our cities better without making them unaffordable? And we think there can. All the work that we've done now almost over a year and a half and the work we've done before has convinced us it will work here in this place, that we can meaningfully lower cost of living, that we actually can dramatically increase convenience, that we can achieve climate positivity, that you know we can get more value and use out of our streets so that people can get where they want to go faster. We believe all those things are possible. And you see all of this as exportable. In other words, the, is the real vision or hope that it becomes something that goes global? I mean, not, I, not run I, I by you, but... I, yeah, I don't ever see, like, somebody picking up what we do here and dropping it off in, you know, the United Arab Emirates or anything like that. But I do think what will happen is people will see... I think we're already seeing that here. Um, people, people will see um, that there are different models and they'll adapt them to themselves. You know, I'm, I'm always reminded of you know, one of the things that I did when I was in city government that I'm most proud of was saving the High Line. And within a year after it opened, there were 36 High Lines under development around the world. Now, they didn't all like the High Line in New York. Now there are grandchildren, basically, of the High Line. I'd put the Bentway as an example on that. Now it's under a highway, um, but in fact, the, the High Line team actually has helped the Bentway, and it's adaptive reuse of old infrastructure. Um, it is a really 
importantly designed private-public partnership. So the lessons actually have been, uh, have been learned, and I think that's the real value is demonstrating what's actually possible. So we, uh, the, the theme here is you know, Canada's competitiveness, our place in the world. We've done a lot of talking about policies that can make us better. And in this context, I mean, you came up in the last panel, it's come up publicly, uh, policies that, that Sidewalk raises. In other words, there are things that we now need, we know we need to tackle. It, what if we turn it to you to say, what are the policies that you see that we're getting wrong? I mean, you're trying to, do, you're trying to build a development, you're trying to do uh, something new and different. Are there obvious places where you would say, look, Canada, you could do this a little differently in order to facilitate innovation and growth? Um, I, you know, I don't, to be honest, um, I think the dialogue that we've had with, now we've literally met in person with 20,000 Torontonians, um, met with hundreds of public officials, um, obviously been the recipient of a lot of interesting dialogue about the, about the project. Um, I think that has overwhelmingly been an incredibly constructive process and to be honest you know we feel pretty welcomed here doesn't mean everybody's going to agree with what we suggest or anything like that and to be honest that that process of engagement I think has made our um, our plans that much more sensitive and smart so I, I'm not I can't be critical about sort of Canada and with respect to us Canada's um, approach to competitiveness. What I do believe is that we are a classic example of what actually could make Canada dramatically more competitive. I believe that when you create this kind of laboratory of urban innovation at scale in which you know, we, uh, with government, are creating, in effect, a platform for innovation that will have open standards and open infrastructure with, it should become a magnet, actually, for Canadian entrepreneurs and Canadian companies and companies from around the world to come here for the first time ever to do all this stuff in the same place and literally create, over time, the global hub of urban innovation. Right? This will be the only place in the world, if we're able to do this together, because we can't do it alone, where we have all these things coming together in one place. We, on the last panel, David referred to an interview that um, The Logic had with uh, the chair of Waterfront Toronto. I don't know if you saw it. I saw a little bit. Um, it seems like he doesn't want you talking about the wooden buildings, um, that you know, we shouldn't be leaking things. It, it struck a, me as an unnecessary adversarial kind of tone. You know, I have to say I'm thrilled um, that uh, Steve Diamond is the chair of Waterfront Toronto. He is incredibly thoughtful. He's very methodical. Um, he doesn't clearly want to negotiate stuff in the press, which is not our intent at all. Um, you know, the, the wooden buildings have been now out there for a long time. I mean, we talked about it last October or November, I think, in some depth. But, you know, I, uh, I actually feel like we're really getting to know each other and um, I'm very excited that he is um, leading Waterfront Toronto. Are you sure you're a New Yorker? I'm actually from Detroit originally. <laughs> that explains the that. The only place I will point out <laughs> that is um, the only place along the 3,000 Cana mile Canadian American border that's actually north of Canada. So I just want to point that out. <laughs> I grew up in an era when there were only three American TV channels watching CBC. So, Excellent. you know. I consider myself almost as close to Honorary. Uh, before we let you go, it, obviously there's going to be stages here. When do we have, what's the end date? A fully functioning, new, uh, ideal, urban center? You know, um, the great thing about these things are is that they're never finished. Um, you know, we are, I think, humble enough to recognize that we can't plan um, the details of the future of a place. I certainly didn't believe that in New York. I don't believe it here. And that if what you are successful doing is creating the conditions for other people uh, to innovate, to bring their ideas and talents, it'll never be done. 
Um, that said, you know, our hope is, we'll, we'll, said we'll get the plan done um, this spring. Um, we will then, over the course of the rest of this year, and who knows beyond, but try and negotiate a partnership with the three levels of government and Waterfront Toronto, uh, depending on how well that goes, start construction maybe toward the end of next year if all goes well, and, you know, different, it'll occur in different phases, those, you know, first 12 acres, that 12 acres quayside, you know, that'll take, once we start construction, three to four years. But hopefully others will pick up the mantle and it'll take third, 25 to 30 years to develop, or more, to develop the whole waterfront. Um, and that will be great. I, look, I just opened up, you and I have talked about it, I worked on a new cultural institution literally from scratch on the west side of Manhattan at the intersection of Hudson Yards and the High Line. It took me 14 years to get it done, but it's now open and it's great. Uh, these things take time. And you, I, one, thing, if I, one thing I learned in government is if you've got to, to be successful getting things done, particularly big things done, you have to operate on two speeds at the same time. You have to be patient because there's process for everything and many, many constituents who have legitimate interests in that process and you have to act with a sense of urgency at all times because if you don't, everything dies of its own weight. So we're trying to find the right way to do that here. We don't always get it right, um, but we're learning as we go. All right, we have to leave it there. Great, Ladies thank you, ma'am. Dan Doctoroff. Thank you.